I'm ready for an Oshawa concert. Yes. Everybody agree with that one? Yes. Yeah, soon. I hope so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's take that breath that we were taking earlier. Just take a very conscious, mindful breath right now. Feel that chair that you're sitting in. Feel your body. And begin to get a sense of yourself right now. Just a sense. Without words, without thoughts, just be right where you are right now. And take another breath and allow this next one to bring you right back here as we co-create this experience this morning. Thank you all for being here today. This is a very exciting day in so many ways. We've been talking about the face of God, the many expressions of God, Melody, a beautiful experience with the Divine Feminine. Uh, Melanie has continued to talk about the many faces of God and all the different expressions. I wanted to go into a little different area this morning, and I really want to relate it to our spiritual journey, because actually, to me, it really mirrors that. And I chose the title for this talk today specifically to convey something different, hopefully. The trans face of God, ineffable. And to me, that word ineffable is, is probably, one of the, to me, one of the best words in the dictionary. It's indescribable. It's like, how do you call God anything? How do you name the nameless? Their language fails to do that. And so to me, it's more about the experience that we have, the embodiment of the energy of whatever it is that we feel at home with, whatever it is that calls to us. I know we hear often we're spiritual beings having on this human journey. And what does that really mean? And we're in this human body, and we have all these words, all these labels. And I thought it would be kind of fun, as well as perhaps a bit challenging to stretch you a little bit, to go a little further into asking the question, is God male? Is God female? How about other? Actually, when I fill out something now, that would be what I would like to put on a piece of paper in my own evolution and my own experience of God expressing as me. I think it would be so amazing. And I could stand up here this morning and give you all kinds of research about many, many cultures who don't just have male, female, and identify in that gender role. Just like our spiritual journey, I grew up with a mix of Russian Orthodox from my mom, who was born in China, she was Russian, and my dad, who was born in Alabama and raised in Texas, fundamental Baptist. So I had these two extremes, yes? And my dad was in the military, so we lived on a military base, and we, there was a chapel. The word church was never really something that was part of my awareness. And honestly, I only thought there were two kinds of religions, if you will, when I was younger. You were either Protestant or you were Catholic. That was my understanding of it. And we didn't go to church very much, actually. Uh, but I heard different things from my mom. And you know, my family was more Bible-based, if you will, in, in that regard. But hers was very different, obviously, than my dad with fundamental Baptist. But my mom had a very dear friend when we lived in Japan, and I was second grade through the fifth grade when we lived in Japan. And her, her name was Mariko, and she was a Buddhist. And I always have very fond memories of Mariko because her energy was so different. So it was really the first time for me, and also living in Japan, the energy at that time, we're talking the late 50s and early 60s, it was a wonderful energy that I always seemed to be aware of. In fact, when I would walk to school, I could see Mount Fuji in the distance. And I would always want to go to the Kyoto and all these cities and, and, and places because there was something that I knew I was drawn to. Again, we're on a spiritual journey. We're ever-evolving. 
And all, all of you here, I'm, I'm guessing, probably would be stretched a bit to come up with a label for yourself as a spiritual being. What would you call yourself? Because again, there are no words, and if you were created in the image and likeness of God, whatever you call God, and God is gender neutral, and, and God possibly is what? Trans, meaning beyond, transgender. Might you not be transgender as well in that regard? Might you be neutral in that regard? Just something to think about, something to ponder. So over here in my life as a spiritual being, expressing as a human, this was the body in which I was born, okay? And I can tell you from my earliest memory, I was uncomfortable in it. But the way I was raised was as a little girl. And the things that I was taught was this is what little girls do. And I would look at my brother and I'd go, God, he gets to do some of the neatest things in the world. And I remember Melody talking about, you know, some of the privilege of, you know, white male and the patriarchal culture in which we've grown up in. And I would always go, God, he gets to do all the cool things. But I always think of, in fact, this tie this morning makes me think so much of my dad. Because he would be in his military uniform, and I would get so excited to go in there and watch him get dressed. And I would think, gosh, I would love to have a uniform like that. I think that would be the coolest thing. And so I spent a lot of my time sort of falling around with my dad. But I also did that with my mom, because there were certain things about my mom that really drew me to her but not the things that said, this is what you're supposed to do, this is what little girls do. My mom is a great cook, and I love to cook. And now I can watch the Food Channel, and what most of the people cooking are guys, and the industry is interesting, the reverse discrimination in that industry that has happened because we think of females and women being in the kitchen traditionally, and here we have men now as the master chef for all these kinds of things. So I think it's fascinating when you really step back and look at how things continue to evolve. So for myself, I remember watching TV shows. And we were in the Philippines when I was really young. I was actually born in Texas. We lived there for a couple years. I was born at Air Force Base. Moved to Massachusetts for a couple years. And then my dad was transferred overseas to the Philippines, to the Clark Air Base. We moved there, I think I was five when I, when I first moved there. And I don't remember much about my childhood and lots of ways. It almost seemed like I blanked out a lot of things because I really struggled with how to be who I was. And again, we're given these descriptors, we're given these roles that we're supposed to conform to, even in our spiritual journey, yes? Okay, same thing. So here I was, as I grew older, trying to navigate my spiritual journey with, okay, Am I a Baptist? Am I a, am I a Russian Orthodox? What am I? And I'm over here going, well, am I a male? Am I a female? What am I? I have no clue. So needless to say, probably the best word to describe most of my life was the state of confusion. And I can honestly say that that has continued until, well, not until, until now. It's, it's always a place that I see and go, okay. And I think confusion is part of, you know, just our experience anyway. At times, so much is coming at us. And, and when we're trying to get a sense of ourselves, and what I'd like to think of feeling that you're connected and you truly are part of the oneness, you're part of what the all that is, and you're not separate. We talk a lot about separation, feeling connected. I can promise you I never felt connected when I was growing up because I knew that what I felt was something very different. And I had nobody to talk to. I had nobody to express it to. And to say, I'm not really sure what to do with these feelings, so I stuffed it. And I remember my mom so badly wanted the little girl to be like her. And I can honestly say, God love you, Mom, when she was trying to dress me like her and all these different things that she tried to do. I even remember watching her. You know, I was saying earlier, I watched my dad get his dress and his uniform and all that. And I see my mom, you know, doing the makeup thing and, and you know, the whole deal. And, and honestly, and this is what I knew too, I said, I don't get it. I never understood that. Even to this day, I never understood why women wore makeup. 
because I thought they were beautiful just like the guys were. So I have felt that way my whole life. And I remember asking my mom questions sometimes, and she would say, well, that's just what we do. And I'd go, who made up that rule? Why does it have to be that way? And I constantly question. And I know a lot of us at times have grown up, and perhaps you still do. You feel like you are in a role or something has been ascribed to you that you are supposed to continue to follow. And that's the path you're supposed to be on. And I can say it has continued to be a very interesting, <laughs> there's another word, fascinating experience as I continue to evolve and become even more and more aware that this body is not what I would choose per se, but I don't want to be in a guy's body either. So when I was doing some research and talking about different cultures and, and, and such and, and how shamans actually and people who walk in both worlds and in tribes were really looked at as elders, they were looked at as sages, they were looked at as people who had a higher connection. And so that is what I claim for myself because that allows me to feel like I am part of all that is. And this beautiful song that you sang, the words can't bring me down because I can promise you there have been many words that have been used towards me that have been very hurtful. And again, I claimed the gay label for the longest because that was the only thing that I could resonate with. So in my spiritual journey, I said, okay, I'll go be a Baptist for a while because all my friends in high school were doing that. And I led a double life because I didn't know how else to be me. It was very difficult back in the 60s. And early, I graduated in 1970 from Wheeler High School here in Cobb County. And my family moved here in the, in the mid-60s. Uh, we were actually in California for a year, but we came here. And if you weren't Baptist, oh my goodness, that was not a good thing. And New Thought had not yet come into my life, so a lot of peer pressure <clears throat> growing up and moving to Georgia, very different culture. Obviously, I grew up with a lot of diversity, uh, extreme diversity, uh, the first 11, 12 years of my life. And then I came here and I thought, oh my. What has happened? <laughs> My brother and I, we thought, okay, what planet have we landed on? <laughs> and I remember telling my mom, everybody here is white, and they talk funny. <laughs> and that was my, my you know, <clears throat> experience around that. And so I felt this pressure for my father because we were back in the South again. And, and also, my mom was kind of in between. She really didn't know what to do with it because she felt like a displaced person as well with a Russian accent and her heritage. Being here was not a comfortable thing. So I was also watching my mom struggle in her spiritual journey. And again, I remember getting baptized at Eastside Baptist Church over here in East Marietta because that's where all my friends were going and I thought that's what I was supposed to do. So I did. And then I became very involved in Roswell Street Baptist Church, which at that time, the late 60s, was the Baptist church to be involved in in Cobb County. Some of you are nodding your head for those of you who have been around here a while. And actually, I became, uh, I was a star athlete at Wheeler High School, so I had a high profile. So I thought, okay, I'll just jump right in there, and I'll do all the things that like the Christian athletes and all that. So I put on that moniker. I did the whole thing because it was a great place to hide. And as stressful as it was, it gave me a place to be. But I knew that I was a hypocrite, and I knew that I was living a lie. And one of the readings, of the reading that Chris did this morning, when it talks about when the universe is pressing up against you and pushing you to be all that you are and to live authentically, and when you continually press it down, what's going to happen? Your body is going to tell the story. And throughout my life, I struggled with obesity for the longest time. You know, I, most of you know, 20 years ago, I released over 100 pounds of dense weight that I carried around for a long time. Extreme depression. And now, what they call type 2 hypomania, I would probably fall somewhere in that category. And I can experience those highs and lows, but I don't do the mania thing. But I can promise you, this is my coming out to you this morning this way, too, because it's a secret that I've kept. But it's something when I look back in my life, I can see the moments in my life 
when I was in those places and I made some of the most horrible decisions in my life because I was not connected to the field as Melody had shared. I was so isolated and so separate and so closeted in my spiritual journey and in my personal life. It was an interesting road. So when I say trans, I mean transcendent. I mean transparent. That I can stand here and truly let you see my face. I can look at you and ask you the same question. What does your face of God reveal about you? What does it say? What is my experience of you if I am with you? And we have what we hear called the namaste experience. Namaste. The God in me sees and honors and recognizes that in you. What does that really mean? I see you as what? Female? As male? As other? If I see you as God, there are no words. It doesn't matter. It makes no difference. And to me, that's the place where I know that we and I, we are all one. And that's a beautiful place to be. You are beautiful. I am beautiful. And that's freedom, folks. That's liberation. And I don't care where you are on your journey. Whatever it is that you are going through, you are called in every moment to stand and take an honest look in that mirror to get truly clear. Are you living an authentic life? Are you allowing you to be you in that fullest expression? Take a breath. Just take a breath. I'd like you to do something with me now if you feel so inclined to participate and the person next to you, I'd like you just to turn to them if you would, if you feel like doing that. If you don't have a person, then just imagine that you are. And I really just want you to look into their eyes for a moment. And when you're looking into their eyes, I just want you to take a breath. I want you just to be right there with that other person that you were having this experience with. Just take a moment and be right there in that experience. And more than the thoughts that you might be having right now, more than the things that you're thinking about or doing, I want you just to notice what is happening right now. Just notice. Even the energy in the room, just notice the energy in the room. Take another very conscious and full breath and let it go. And when you're ready, just bring your attention back here to the front of the room. What I'm offering you this morning is to be more in touch with and more aware of what it is you experience in that moment with yourself, engage with another person, because to me, it is the experience of God that's happening in that moment. And when we are looking at another and we are connecting heart to heart, face to face, it's truly being able to see beyond, trans again, beyond what is right in front of you. And to have a sense in, in the sensory field, a knowing of that oneness, of that connection, of that wholeness. To me, living an authentic life is really about living freely. It's about standing in your truth and having the courage to walk your talk and to let 
your voice be heard. To be that voice for love. It's interesting too, as I continue to become more and more aware, I can look back on so many things and how much energy I put into, like I shared earlier, living a double life. How much energy I put into putting on a different face because I was so frightened that I would not be accepted or loved. And, and the thing about it was, I know a lot of us in our, in our nuclear families when we were growing up, we may not have felt connected, we may not have felt whole, we may have had some sense of separation and perhaps some of you, I know some people who have grown up with a beautiful family experience. And when they're telling me about it, I'm like, wow, that is so cool. You know, so what I've allowed myself to do is go back in my mind and recreate relationships and experiences with my family. I know when my mom passed back in 2002, when I was in the midst of my own breast cancer journey, she and I had a very rough road throughout most of her life. But what I do know is she did the best she could. And that was a lot of what she was here to teach me. So whatever it is that you come up against and something is not going like you want it to, and it involves maybe another person really intimately, just allow yourself to know that they're doing the best they can in that space of where they are right now. So I had the opportunity to do a lot of my forgiveness work with my mom after she passed. I had already been doing a lot of it prior to her passing. I had already grieved our relationship that really had never unfolded in the way that I would have liked. But then I recognized, you know what, Jeannie? Again, and, and I'm grateful for new thought and new teachings that came into my life 25 years ago so that I could reframe things, so that I could rewrite my stories, and so that I could write a new story right now every day and speak from that place of saying, yes, here I am. This is, this is it. And to know that it is not just enough, it is more than enough. To know that I am more than enough. To know that you are more than enough. But my mom, I can see how she really struggled in her own acceptance of herself as well. So how could she be okay with me when she wasn't okay with her? It was a very difficult journey. And I said I never forget her trying to dress me like her, even in high school. We would have really intense arguments, junior, senior year, about how I should dress when I go to school. When I came out to my family when I was 27 years old, it was not a pretty experience. I ended up not being able to see my nieces later on when they were born. And I was estranged from my brother for 18 years. And gratefully, when I moved back to Georgia 20 years ago, we have a pretty wonderful relationship now. And so I'm grateful for that. And my brother has stretched and grown. And his face of God, to me, was always beautiful. But now, it's even more expansive. And it has the most beautiful age lines on it, if you will. And I can see through to his soul. It's so beautiful. And my mom, we'd have these arguments, and then when I came out, it was not a good thing, but I knew it was what I needed to do, because it was, at least, it was at least one more place that I didn't have to continue lying. And that was a huge relief. Secrets will make you sick. And so we struggled, because she still wanted me to be married and have kids and all that, and I was... I was so ashamed. And I said, Mom, I'm so sorry. I'm not the little girl. I'm not the daughter you always wanted me to be. I don't know how else to be. And I still didn't have a clue. I was just fumbling my way through it without role models, without ideas, life in my spiritual journey. Finally, after my experience at Russell Street Baptist Church, and I, I dressed in drag, and that's what I want to call it. You can go to my Facebook page, and if you go into my photos, there are some photos in there of me going to prom in high school, of me and, uh, you know, in a dress and all of that. I mean, I, call, I look back and I go, I was dressed in drag. I mean, I really was. 
And, and so my mom would go, oh, you're so pretty, you know, and I would hear it. And, and I would go, okay, because it would please her. It made her happy. And the same thing in my spiritual journey, to go to the proper church or to do the right thing and to act in a certain way in the spiritual journey, it allowed me to be more accepted. And when I started going outside the box in the spiritual journey, whew, you know how that goes. What do they talk it? The chemicalization. When things start coming up because now you're entering into belief systems and ideas and concepts and philosophies that there's just so much information. Take a breath. So as each of you continue on your journey, I call it the transcendent experience to where we can rise above experiences that we've had. We can rise above places where we've been and allow ourselves to see and know something greater. Where we can say, yes, I'm willing, I'm open. Be ye transformed, transformed, right, into form by what? The renewing of your mind. So if your mind is open and you're willing to say, you know what, I'm going to enter into the next phase of my life in beginner mind. I'm going to allow everything that I know to still be with me, but I'm not going to be wedded to those particular things. I'm going to be open to seeing the true face of God, the trans face of God. Because I can tell you there are people out there now, the word trans is tossed about a lot these days. It's gotten a lot of press for TV shows and reality shows and people now who have been coming out about all kinds of things. And I don't really want to get into all that this morning. I really want to just offer that in so far as the part for me that's very important for you to hear is there are people out there that are creating their own community. Like Thomas More in his new book, A Religion of One's Own, for those of you who are familiar with Thomas More who have care of the soul, who talks about creating your own spirituality, creating your own religion, if you will. And that's what a lot of people are doing. I think Melanie was talking about Sunday, I forget what it was called, Sunday gatherings or some kind of something where people, were, Sunday assembly or whatever it was, where people are gathering together. Because there are people who are actually making physical changes in their body. They're having surgeries and doing all kinds of things so that they can feel more at home within themselves and more comfortable in their own skin. And yet they're struggling as to find a place where they can go and be in a spiritual community. So wherever you are in your journey, whatever is going on for you, I really challenge you and I invite you to just allow yourself to continue to be open, to continue to truly see beyond the outer appearance, outer appearance and truly look at the face of God. Take a breath, breathe it in. You are beautiful, and you truly are amazing. And I'm so grateful for every single one of you. So let's take these words now into a time of meditation.